Thank you very much. Uh, nice to see you. Pity it's not live, but um, all right. oh. one second. Okay. So I'm going to discuss a well known problem in classical physics, which is the first passage time, but the focus will be on a, a quantum analog of this. And um, we want to define what is the meaning of the first passage time. Uh, then we'll present some uh, quantum renewal equation, which is a basic tool with which we can calculate all kinds of the statistics of this uh, process. Uh, I'll discuss a little bit about these dark and bright spa uh, spaces, which uh, are due to uh, destructive interference that create a problem for quantum search in the sense that uh, some quantum search, uh, first passage times in, in essence are very uh, unfavorable compared to the classical ones. I'll explain what I mean later. I'll introduce some uncertainty principle for this process. And at the second stage of the talk, uh, we will discuss uh, special purpose walks. This is a new work with uh, Quan Cheng Liu. Uh, where we find a very special type of searcher, which we call the massless Dirac searcher. And this is related to exceptional points uh, of the size of the Hilbert space. We, we had a little bit on Dirac and uh, exceptional points last week. And maybe if I have time, this will be also interesting here. Okay, so what do I mean by the classical first passage time? Consider that we have this uh, graph, this Benzen ring. And on this, on this uh, structure, we have a random walk. Uh, let's say the walker starts at point three and you want to know what is the first time, sometimes called the heating time, that it reached, let's say, the, this vertex zero. So the typical questions in the classical walk are, first of all, uh, does the particle arrive from, let's say, three to zero? Uh, and when does it arrive? And then what is the distribution of the arrival times, et cetera? Now, in a quantum world, there is no path. And since there is no path, there is no meaning for the first passage time or first arrival time. Instead, we will have to describe a protocol where we have in included the measurements inside. And again, this was also discussed last week where we have the influence of the measurements uh, that will eventually uh, help us define the path. And then we can ask questions like, what is the first time, not for arrival, but for detection. So in this talk, we have this graph, but uh, I'll, I'll compare it once in a while to classical random walk. But what do I mean by this graph? Well, we have states. Uh, these can be all kinds of quantum states, zero, one, two, etc. I will talk about them as if they are spatial states, but they don't necessarily have to be. And we have some links. These links are hopping amplitudes from site zero to five and from, and from zero to one, et cetera. So this structure actually describes an Hamiltonian, a tight binding Hamiltonian with jumps, let's say to nearest neighbors. We can work on different types of graphs, for example, here on this Benzen ring, but we can do it on a line like here. And the Hamiltonian in mind, let's say for this line is this simple Hamiltonian where you have hops to nearest neighbors described by this Hamiltonian, you go from X to X plus one and from X to X minus one with this hopping rate with an amplitude of rate. So there's no decoherence in this uh, model so far. Uh, later, we'll have to introduce the, the measurement protocol to define the first detection. But before that, so now there is no first passage time. I just want to point out one experiment that you can have uh, some understanding on this type of quantum walks. This is an experiment done by the group of Silberberg with waveguides. So you, you enter in some node, that would be also our typical initial condition, some localized initial condition. And then you can hop to nearest neighbors. And then in many different types of experiments at some time t, you can measure the probability of being on these waveguides in this example, but Similar experiments are done, let's say, with atoms or ions. And then what you have here is you need to solve the Schrodinger equation and get the probability of being in any one of these nodes. And the solution of the Schrodinger equation in this case looks something like this. So we have this destructive interference in the middle. Um, and these two peaks that you have here are spreading out ballistically. 
And you can see this in this experiment, you see these peaks here and here. And um, so this is just a proof of the Schrodinger equation. You can more or less reconstruct the wave function modulo squared at some time t. And these two peaks are moving ballistically, very different from Gaussian diffusion, which has a Gaussian peak in the middle. Our question will be more, what will be the first time until you detect the particle, let's say here. So how do we define this? So now we introduce the measurement protocol. So we consider all types of graphs. For example, a cube, the cube can be hypercube in B dimension. The hypercube, by the way, describes spin systems. For example, three spins up, two up and one down, etc. So this could be also a random walk in Fox space. But again, we will consider special uh, language at least. So we have this graph and we have some initial localized state, x0, and we want to detect the particle in xm, m for measurement. So the experimentalist that we have in mind does the following. Uh, she uh, measures on this local measurement here, and she asks the question, is the particle here? Uh, yes or no? So the measurement is such that you have unitary dynamics on the Hamiltonian, and then at time tau, there is a measurement. Let's say measurement is now. Then another unitary dynamics measurement. Let's say again, a measurement no. And this process then continues. And then eventually, possibly you get a yes. So the yes will define the first detection probability time. N times this tau will be the first detection time. And tau here is a parameter of choice. We can vary tau in different ways. In principle, we cannot take tau so small because then we'll run into the zero limit. So there is an optimal tau. Now this process was uh, uh, promoted in the context of quantum computing. And the question is, will the time it takes the particle, let's say to arrive from here to here on a hypercute in high dimensions would be faster compared to the classical random walk. And people have shown, for example, Grovey and Bloom, that indeed in some cases, due to constructive interference, the process of transfer will be very fast compared to the classical raw. But on the other hand, sometimes you will never detect. And I'll go into this detail later. Uh, there are many works on this. Uh, I'll mention later some works of Bloombaum and also Abhishek Dar uh, have worked on this uh, uh, type of problem. So a lot is known about this already. So um, the, just to repeat, we get this string, no, 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 and then a yes. And the, in the end entry, we get the yes. And then n times tau is the random first detection event. Now, what is not trivial is that the measurement process collapses the wave function at each time that you get a no, setting the amplitude on the detected uh, side to be zero. So in operator language, we project out XM component every time we measure a no. So we have a, a, a measurement a, a dynamics, which is a combination of unitaries and projections, unitaries and projections. Uh, but between the measurements, the Hamiltonian will describe the dynamics with this time scale tau. Okay, this is the name of the game. And there are many, many problems like, will you detect the, the particle eventually? What time? And later on, I'll also discuss what are the best Hamiltonians to make this search very fast and very efficient. So first, let us discuss the basic formalism. And I want to remind you some basic thing that was known to Erwin Schrodinger more than 100 years ago. And that is how we analyze classical first passage times. For example, in diffusion processes, this is the more or less the first page in the book of Redner. So th there is a very nice connection between occupation probabilities and first passage time statistics. So what is the general idea? Consider a Brownian motion, let's say in two dimension, and it follows for time t. Uh, and then we are very much used to the, the question, what is the probability starting somewhere and ending somewhere else? And this takes time at time t. So this will be the Gaussian propagator of occupation probabilities. Now, if you think about this path, you can decompose it into two parts. One of them is you start somewhere and you arrive at this destination for the first time. And then after that, you create this loop. 
So the first arrival time will happen in a previous time, and then you create this loop such that the sum of these times are the same. From this basic idea, which is valid for, this philosophy is valid for Markovian process, we can construct a relation between the probability of arrival for the first time uh, from here to here, and the probability of occupying this place for the first time together with the probability of making a return. This is the method that many uh, first passage times in classical random walks are calculated. Now, what happens, uh, and this, this method is called the, the renewal equation. So what is the quantum renewal equation? We have a very similar equation in quantum mechanics. So first of all, the most basic quantity in this field uh, was uh, promoted by uh, Dar. Uh, um, a few years ago, this is this reference from 2015, and he introduced to this concept of phi n. Phi n is the amplitude of first detection at the end event. That is the first time you get a click, there is an amplitude, not a probability. Um, we are interested in the probability, which like uh, many other uh, quantities in quantum mechanics is simply the square of phi n. So notice here that n is a measure of time. So it's not like the wave function, but it's in some sense replaces the wave function in these type of problems. So what we could show is the following, and we could show this renewal equation that is given here. And this states the following. If you have some initial condition, and then you go with the unitary evolution, here there's no measurement to, to this final state xm, this is the same as going for the first time this is this phi j here to the final state xm and then creating this loop with the unitary evolution going from xm to xm. So this is exactly the same uh, as what I showed you in the previous slide, but instead of using probabilities, I'm using amplitudes. And to understand this better, uh, let's take for example, n equal one. If n equal one, then uh, we have here phi one is simply the initial condition, unitary dynamics, xm. This is what you all learned in quantum mechanics. The probability to detect for the first time in the first measurement is simply given by the evolution, the unitary evolution. This is the amplitude, square this, get the first, the first event probability. What happens for phi two? Then you start with the initial condition, you do unitary dynamics, then you project out because you got the first one was a no, you project out on this measurement uh, and then you do another unitary and you reach XM. So we can analyze all this. Of course, you continue this for phi three, phi four, or you can analyze this type of renewal equation. So why is this renewal equation so nice? This is because this is a convolution. And then I can express here uh, using something called the Z-transform, which is like the Laplace transform, I can find a very general solution to finding phi n, uh, which is the following. Um, so we, what we do is um, following Schrodinger, who did it in the classical world, um, we say, we, we, let us assume now just for notation simplicity that the initial condition is the same as the detection site. We define a generating function. This is Zn to phi n. If I know this generating function, then I can calculate these phi n's. And then because of this convolution, I can find this uh, generating function and relate it to the wave function free of any measurement. So this is the solution of the Schrodinger equation of the corresponding problem where you have the same initial conditions like the original problem, you need to calculate in Z space. That is, you need to know the wave function at the times of your measurement at time tau, time two tau, et cetera, et cetera. And then once you have this solution of the uh, evolution free wave function, then you can calculate the first detection problem. Now this formula is exactly the same like the classical renewal equation, which relates between the first passage probability of classical random walk. This is discrete time random walk and the occupation probability. So all I do here is replace an amplitude with a probability. Here is an amplitude with a probability and I do it in Z space because of this convolution. Of course, the physics here is going to be vastly different because amplitudes and probabilities are not the same, 
But the technique is very similar to what people are doing for more than 100 years in the context of classical random walks. So now the rest of the talk, um, I'm got, just got, going to present um, some consequence of this uh, equation. And the first thing, it was discussed a little bit uh, last week. Um, so I'm going to mention this very briefly. Let us consider the quantum walk on the line. So you have hop hopping to nearest neighbors and you use this uh, renewal equation and then uh, we calculate the amplitudes, then we calculate the probabilities of first detection after n event, n is one, two, et cetera. What we find here is that this uh, function decays like at large n, like n to the power three. This is different than the classical random walk, which decays uh, as well known in one dimension, like three over two. So what is happening here, this is the way I explain it, the classical random walk decays like three over two, but because amplitudes, you need to square them, instead of three over two, you get three over two to the power two. And then you get this one over n to the power three. Uh, but in addition, you get also a phase, this beta and this cosine. So you see here, these are these oscillations that you get in the first passage time, which are typical to quantum walks. But now you see it in the time domain. And on top of this, you have this famous power law with this n to the power three. Of course, we analyzed what is beta, what is the prefactor. This depends on things like the distance of the particle and the detector, et cetera. And if you're interested in more details, let's go to the physical review letters here uh, for more details. But I want to discuss actually what I find very surprising is that actually I want to discuss finite systems, not this infinite line system. Uh, I see there's a question. There's a uh, question uh, from the audience. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, actually I had a question in the renewal equation that you showed in, in one of the slides uh, af after this. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, in terms of the generating function, like where, where is the information about the measurement here? Well, uh, the, the information in the measurement, that, that's the, first of all, in my opinion, that's exactly the beauty of it. The, me the measurement uh, is found, okay. The measurement is found, of course, in the definitions of these collapses here that give you phi one, phi two, etc. The information in the measurement is this XM. So XM, I re recall, is the measurement site. So in this sense, everything depends on where you measure. Uh -huh. But the whole beauty of the, of the equation, of both equations, both the quantum equation and the, uh, and the classical equation, is eventually you do not need to treat the problem of the measurement. But of course, the measurement comes here. This is this XM you go and treat the simpler problem, which is without the measurement. And exactly the same is done in all the renewal, pro renewal equations. That's the idea of the renewal equation. Uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, but like whether I choose tau from like delta function distribution or from some other distribution, okay. that's immaterial. Right. Okay, absolutely. This is a good question. So in our works, we have a recent work from last year where we, we do not measure every tau units of time. We, we measure from any distribution of waiting times. So this specific equation, uh, you can write indeed only for this troposcopic measurement. But we have other works where we deal with more general waiting time distribution. And again, I want to repeat this tau is an important parameter that you the experimentalist, so to say, is choosing because of the Zeno limit. It's not, it's a free parameter and we discuss it a lot, how to choose it, how to optimize, etc. Okay. But indeed, these are true for the stroboscopic measurements. I see, thank you. Okay, so we had one uh, a non classical behavior, uh, these oscillations and this power law, but now let us see uh, many more uh, uh, surprising effects in my mind, at least. So the first question is very simple. We have a, a finite system, some graph, and then the question is uh, do you detect or you do you not detect? So for that aim, I'm going to define the detection probability with simply the sum of all the probabilities Fn and going from one till infinity. 
Um, if, if, the, if, you, if PDAC is one, it means that you detect with probability one. And for finite systems that I'm going to discuss in classical random walks, P detection is, is one, and this is related to ergodicity. Uh, we find, okay, we find this beautiful equation that for you maybe is very uh, boring, but this equation gives you P detection exactly in terms of the eigen energies of the system, uh, eigen states of the system. So you need to diagonalize the Hamiltonian. If you can do that, you have here the XM and the initial state, and you can calculate this P det. Don't worry uh, if you don't know all the details, I'm going to explain this very briefly. There is one striking thing about this equation. This P det is independent of tau. It's universal. So there are some observables that do not depend on tau, but other observables do. And one of the questions is, when does some observable depend on this tau and when does it not? But this one does not. And there is another thing here that you see here, GL, GL is the degeneracy. In the case where your spectrum of energy is not degenerate, then your detection probability is going to be unity. Uh, so we will discuss this and we will see what happens. Okay, so anyway, we, we, we found out this equation and then we said, okay, let us, this, this equation, let us uh, show some sp special examples. And then I got this surprise from my student, uh, Itaim Walem, and this is the following uh, figure. So what do we have here? We have here all kinds of graphs uh, and here the empty spot is, is the where, where do I detect? And then I, I start localizing on all these nodes. So this is the ring. And if I start at this point, then probability half, this is this half here, I will detect the particle. If I start here, probability half. W what does this mean? In half of the realizations of the measurement process, I do not discover the particle. It's like dark for me. <coughs> If I use this cube, so if I start from the nearest neighbor, it's one over third. And here it's, if I start on the other hand on the diagonal, it's one. And you see here, all to all connected, this is one over seven. And you see um, immediately some symmetry. And we want to un understand this a bit better. So first of all, from the point of view of engineering, what you see here is that the quantum work is not a good searcher because in many cases it, it does not find uh, the target. Uh, even if you start from the nearest neighbor, it's pretty bad. Um, on the other hand, sometimes you detect with probability one and actually like here to here, and then we can also show that it's very fast. So is quantum search good? The answer is sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. It depends on the initial condition and the symmetry of the system. Okay, so let us try and understand why if I start here, for example, I do not detect a particle with probability one. And this there's is a also- question. Sorry, there's another question. Go ahead, yes. Carlos. Yes, uh, uh, about this probability of detection. So it, it clearly doesn't depend on town, but then this is the probability for detection of, uh, what, for detection on a specific site at yes. any possible time. So you are integrating over time. I'm, sum, I'm summing because my measurements, th this is the sum. So I ask, what is the probability of measuring in the first event, in the second, the sum of all of them? That is the eventual probability that you will detect sometime. You don't care where. Will I detect or will I not detect? It's so like in the classical world, the survival probability doesn't decay to zero, it decays to some constant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like in a three-dimensional random walk in an infinite lattice, you can escape according to Pugliato infinity. Here it happens even for small systems. Yeah, so it's not probability of first detection, it's just probability no. of detection. Okay, okay. Of detection, I sum over n, right. So, let us try and understand why this happens and how this is related to um, symmetry. So this was already pointed out uh, by Plenio in the context of light harvesting systems. I'll explain a little bit why. So let us consider this uh, ring again. And let us start with an initial condition, which is a linear combination of these two nearest neighbors. So this is an initial condition. We then let the system evolve in time. We make the measurements here. 
And of course the wave function will evolve, but what is kind of clear is that for any given time t, never mind when, there is some amplitude being here will be the same as here. And then you will have some current into this state. And I claim, and I hope this is intuitive, that here you have some constructive interference and this state that you start with these two states here is what we call a bright state. It is detected with probability one. On the other hand, let us consider a different initial condition that here we have an amplitude which is negative compared to this initial condition. Here we have also the symmetry of the system to take into consideration. And then the current into this uh, site where I measure is going to be zero. This is destructive interference. And with this initial condition, no matter how many times I measure, I will never measure the particle on this state because any current coming in from here will be canceled from here. So this guy is detected with probability zero. This guy is detected with probability one. And this initial condition that I had before is the sum of these two initial conditions. This guy will be detected with probability one half. Now you can ask, what is the connection of all this to light harvesting systems? So of course in last light harvesting systems, we do not have um, repeated strong measurements as I do, but Plenio and Caruso, they model this very specific model with a kind of a non-emission term here. And they get the same conclusion. And what is their conclusion is that what they saw in nature was that in, okay, what is this uh, process in light harvesting system? You have some exciton. And the question is how will it transfer to some reaction center here? And this has to be very efficient if you want to transfer the, the energy of the sun into chemical energy as done in all the plants in, that we know of, of. And then what they claim is to uh, make this more efficient, it's much better if you have some breaking of symmetry. What does it mean? Assume that you have some disorder in the system. Then this symmetry that I had before will be broken and then you will detect the particle with probability one. This is also what our general formula says, some disorder, some breaking of the symmetry and the de detection probability will turn into one. Now, this is very nice because usually you say, um, you know, that if you have disorder is bad for you because of Anderson localization. But actually what we see here from the point of view of detection, a little bit of disorder will make the detection possible and P detection will be one. So this uh, fact that we found these um, suboptimal detection probability, this is related to symmetry of the graphs. And we can formalize this in a very uh, simple way uh, in the following way. We can give an upper bound that relates between the symmetry and the detection probability. So to do this, um, we do the following. We start with an initial condition, which is a linear combination of two sites, uh, Ri and Rj. And we have some phase in between. This is our initial condition. Now these sites Ri and Rj are, uh, the, the game is that these are identical with respect to the uh, measurement device. And if so, the probability, when you start with this initial condition, to go to the detector because the renewal equation is all linear, like all quantum mechanics, is the same as the amplitude of going from this initial condition to the final state and the, the, the second one to this guy. But the point is that these two amplitudes from symmetry have to be the same thing. So if they are the same, because these two initial conditions, R, I, R, and R, J is are the same, then we can uh, show that going from this initial condition, psi initial to this final state is the same as choosing one of them, let's say Ri to Xm and this phase that I choose. Now, we know that th this sum for any initial condition, the sum over all the probabilities from any initial condition has to be less or equal one. And that's why when I sum these guys, this has to be satisfying this bound. So P detection, um, going from Ri to Xm, if I have two identical sites on my graph, has to be less than half, if I have two of them identical. And more generally, uh, the p-detection going from Ri, some site, 
to xm is less or equal to one over nu. And what is nu? Nu is the number of states which are equivalent to ri on my graph. For example, here I have two sites, this one and this one with respect to the measurement device. So nu is going to be equal to. On the cube, we have three, and then the symmetry will give you one over three, etc. So this is a very simple bound that relates between the symmetry and this detection probability. Of course, if you break the symmetry, then there are no states, which initial states, which are equivalent, and then this goes into one. Um, I want to uh, speed up a little bit, so I'll kind of you know, skip some things. Uh, and I want to go into a different uh, 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 issue. So we, we show now what is the detection probability, a little bit about this uh, in some uh, systems. But now we want to ask, uh, what is the time? How long does it take the particle to be first detected? And we, we are going to discuss this simple ring structure. And um, we have many discussions on other structures because it contains here a surprise. So we have here a ring of size six and we can calculate the generating function with, from the renewal equation. The details are not so important. And then we can find this phi n. And we are going to consider a very special initial condition. We are going to start when we start here and we measure here. This is called the return problem. In our papers, you can also see then when, you know, when we start in other locations. Sorry about this. So we are asking how long, oh, I'm going the wrong way. How long will it take you to return to zero. So we release the particle here after time tau we measure, after two time we measure, and then we have all these probabilities of detecting, and then we want to know things like the average time. So here we got a surprise, but eventually this we found out that this was found previously by some beautiful work by Grunbaum and Velasquez and Werner, this paper. And this is related to the fact that the average N, which is the same as the average return time, so n times tau is an integer. This is a quant, it, it's quantized. This is very different. Uh, again, it's, it, uh, it's shown here for this ring and you see it's four most of the time. And then in special taus, you have these jumps, very sudden and violent jumps, but always to integers. This is related to a topological effect. I'll not go into the whole details. It's related to the fact that the generating function, uh, if you plot it in the, in, uh, in the complex plane is winding and the number of winds is related to this average time. This is very different than classical walks. We, we don't have this type of quantization. It is also very different than any other initial condition. So again, we plot here the average n versus tau and most of the time it's four. Okay, and you see it's robust most of the time, and then we have these dips. Now let us look at this um, small tau limit. Small tau limit is special. If tau goes to zero, then you detect after one event. This is obvious because if I started my measurement and I detect there, then after one event I detect and then average n is one. But if I have any tau which is small, the average is four. So what is going on here? This uh, small tau limit, uh, also Abhishek worked about this quite a lot, is called the Zeno limit that you measure very quickly. Okay, so what is happening here? Usually when a uh, tau is small, usually uh, you release the particle, usually you find the particle after one measurement. But if tau is finite, what happens sometimes in a rare event, you do not detect the particle. And then what happens is, okay, you didn't detect the particle and now you're measuring it very, very fast and then you will never detect it again. So most of the measurements you get one, that is you detect after one event. But once in a while you get zero and then you collapse your wave function on the detected state. Now the particle is not on, on this initial state anymore. 
And then it will take you an infinite amount of time to measure. And the average between one and infinity apparently is this winding number, which is four. Anyone wants to guess what is this for? In this, this is related to the specific example of the ring. Okay, I'll give you a few more minutes. Why is it for? Um, but it's also obvious that when you have these jumps, these are related to revivals of the wave packet. Uh, the variance of n diverges, and I'll go into this detail in, into this a little bit uh, soon. So before going into these details, uh, let me ask the following question. Here I have my recent paper with Abichai Didi. It's on CONMAT. And now we change the rules of the game a little bit. Instead of measuring the particle on one node, local measurements, we do the following. We measure the position operator on this ring of size six. And then we have a trajectory. So the first measurement, let's say, you measure at one, then you measure at four. This is the position operator two, zero. And you, you, you ask, what is the first time till you reach this zero? This is the, the measurement place. So again, you have random event. And here the average N is again, a constant independent of tau like before, but now it's six. It's again related to topology. So what is this uh, six? This is the number of uh, sites that we have in the system. We could prove this in general. And what is this four here? This is the number of energy levels in the system, which are non-degenerate. So in a ring of size six, we have four distinct energy levels, and this is this four. So, and, and again, this is related to some topology. Uh, if you are interested, then we can talk later. So I want to go back to the local measurements and, um, and try and understand, um, especially the fluctuation next to these uh, special points that we saw this day. Um, so let us go a little bit into math and then make the math very simple. And this will be related to some exceptional points also. So um, phi n, this is the amplitude of phase detection. Uh, this was in the previous uh, transparency, is this operator S, this is the survival operator, which I'm going to define here, to the power N minus one. N minus one means that you add N minus one lows, and then you have this unitary detection and you go from the initial condition to the final state. What is the survival operator? This is this unitary step, and then the projection on Xn. Now, as usual in quantum mechanics or any problem in linear algebra, uh, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of, of this operator are important. So what you need to know in these type of problems, like many other problems, is to find the eigenvalues of this survival operator. This is not a unitary evolution because of this uh, uh, projection. And this is given as usual by this determinant and using what is called the matrice de determinant lemma, we could find a very simple formula, which is relating this uh, unitary dynamics with this loop again. And this has to be equal zero to find the eigenvalues. Now, if you rewrite this as XM, as a linear combination of these energy states, which is a very common trick, then this part of the formula, uh, you can rewrite very easily because the U is just giving you these phases here as the sum K equals zero. This is the sum on the energy states of PK divided by Z minus exponential minus energy times tau. And we need to take this to be equal zero to find the eigenvalues. What is this PK? This is the, this is the overlap of the energy states of the Hamiltonian with the detected states. Uh, all, these energies, all these eigenvalues are in the unit disk. Now, this is mathematics. It's very simple mathematics, but I want you to focus on this formula. Uh, what Grunbaum showed is that you can map this problem of finding these eigenvalues to a charge theory. And this charge theory is beautiful and very simple. It simplifies the problem once you get used to it. So I want to think about these charges 
uh, this is going to be charge PK, which is this overlap. And here I have some force field. And this is the Z minus this thing. And if it's equal to zero, then the demand will be that these charge charges that I'm going to explain again soon, a uh, create a force field, which is equal to zero. And this, with this, we can analyze the problem and understand these eigenvalues. So let me uh, just repeat what I said now slowly. What do we do operationally? We have energy levels of the Hamiltonian, let's say five of them. And we put on the unit disk, we put uh, charges, which are these PKs. These are determined by the, what you measure, by this overlap. This is a positive charge. This is its location, and we have them. These create a force field in the unit disk, and where this force field is zero, then this is the eigenvalue that I'm looking for of the survival operator. Now, this is very uh, neat because now we don't need quantum mechanics and we can understand uh, what is the behavior of these eigenvalues. And if I can understand the behavior of the eigenvalues, I can understand many things, for example, on the fluctuations on, and also in very fast type of dynamics. So what, what happens, uh, what is uh, gonna be, what I'm gonna call slow process is when these eigenvalues approach the unit disk. If these uh, eigenvalues are close to the unit disk, then the relaxation is going to be very slow. On the other hand, if all the eigenvalues are here in the middle, this will create exceptional point and that will lead us to very fast detection. So bear in mind this type of picture. So let us start with a not so good search. So when does this eigenvalue approach the unit disk? Imagine a situation where the overlap, that is the overlap between some energy state and this XM is very, very small. So let's say we have here these, uh, let's call them gravitational objects. And one of them is very, very, very weak mass. Let's say this is the moon and the rest of them are the, let's say, suns. So you know that there is a stationary point very close to this point. From quantum mechanics, what is happening, if there is no overlap between the detection state and this energy state, this eigenvalue is going to be on the unit disk and it's kind of going to be a dark state. So you can perform some perturbation theory on this charge picture and calculate the position of this charge if one of the overlaps is very small. And then for the return problem, uh, once you know this eigenvalue, you can calculate the variance and it's given by this thing. And this is the perturbation theory, which is a classical perturbation theory for this location. Um, and then you can ask again, what will happen if you have two charges which are merging. For example, if the two energies are coming close by, then in this case, what you get is one of these eigenvalues will go to the unit disk. And if they go to the unit disk, this is because they are disappearing from the effective Hilbert space. They are becoming a dark state. They cannot be detected. That is the meaning quantum mechanically. But if you have here, two charges, it's very easy to find the stationary point by neglecting all the other charges in between. And we can find this. And then again, we can calculate the variance of the fluctuations. So remember the average, uh, average was quantized in this return problem. This was given just by the winding number, the number of um, essentially the number of zeros here inside, which was this four or this, in this problem, but now we, we can calculate this variance by analyzing this thing. And of course, we can also have two points coming close to the unit second. And this is uh, interesting because then they can interfere one with another. A very special case is also when your tau is small. If your tau is small, all these, this is the Zeno limit, then all these charges are going to be very close one to another in this language. And then in this convex hull, we will get all these eigenvalues coming close one to the other. They all coalesce together. 
And this distance will give an upper bound, a lower bound to the distance from the unit disk. And then we could uh, find out a new type of un uncertainty principle. Because if I know this, uh, um, these eigen, eigenvalues, again, these are eigenvalues of the survival operator, then I can calculate the fluctuations of the time till I first detect. This is this fluctuation of the time. And this is given by this uncertainty principle. It's delta E. Delta E is the difference between the maximum energy and the minimal energy squared. Delta T squared. Delta T is N. Uh, T is N times tau here. So it has a fluctuations because sometimes you measure quickly, sometimes you measure after a long time. And this is bigger than eight. Uh, this can come from only from a calculation on this. Uh, this winding number, this is the average number of um, uh, this average n that I was talking before for in our example, time h bar square. Now this uncertainty principle is very different than usual energy uh, time uncertainty principles for two main reasons. One of them, it's related to this topological effect. You see this w, it's w minus one. It's actually very easy to understand uh, why you have this winding number because Imagine you have a system which has only one state. Then of course, then there's no fluctuation and then this winding number minus one has to be zero. Uh, but the second issue is that this delta T, unlike the usual uncertainty principle is really due to some fluctuation because it's the first detection time. So this time obviously fluctuates. Sometimes you measure quickly and sometimes less quickly. And this is the meaning of this uh, uncertainty principle. So we could uh, analyze, this is again, this problem of the ring. Um, we could, uh, we, we before said that the average N was uh, quantized and you had these very special points where you jump. And next to these jumping points, for example, here in this Zeno limit, we get this divergence of the variance. The variance is blowing up. And in this case, it's because of the Zeno limit. So many, uh, many of these um, eigenvalues of the survival operator are approaching the unit disk and you have this big divergence. And along these divergences that you see here, uh, Ruyo Ying, who analyzed this, he found different cases. For example, two points merging or three points merging and things like that. And these uh, colors are the theory that work very nice close to this divergence. And in between, well, in between, you need to calculate all the eigenvalues. You cannot use only a few that are approaching the unit disk. Okay, so after we did this, we realized something um, that we are doing something a little bit silly. Why don't we, uh, why do we let these uh, eigenvalues approach the unit disk? Let's let, 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 them make, let them be small. And here, this is what we're going to do. This is my re recent work with Quan Xing Liu. And we want to present, uh, now we are, I'm changing to a mode of engineering, I would say. Uh, we want to design Hamiltonians that create these random walks in such a way that the search is very fast and very efficient. So obviously we cannot have symmetry, we cannot have degeneracy because then we have this suboptimal detection. But how can we uh, detect? And okay, what we create this, the bottom line, we create some Hamiltonians uh, on this system and we find an efficient way of search. This is going to be called the crawl model, which is related to Dirac. And this is called the funnel model. And um, they are different and I'm going to discuss this very efficient search. So what is the idea? It's very simple at the beginning at least. If you understand the charge picture, let us design a, a system where our charges, which are the locations of the phases of the unitary exponential i, e, k, tau, they are on the unit circle like before but I want to arrange them in such a way that there is only one from symmetry, there is only one eigenvalue here in the middle. And this is a, an exceptional point. It's a degenerate point. All the eigenvalues of the survival operator that was spread out now are here in the middle. 
And if you have a very small eigenvalue, it means a very fast relaxation of Fn. In addition to the equal distance that we have here, we also have to have that all the charges, this PK are one over omega. This is essentially the size of the Hilbert space. And these energy differences, these energies of our Hamiltonian should, should satisfy this thing. If we have such a system, then we have a system where the eigenvalues are the smallest possible. And the intuitive idea is that these guys are going to be very good for search because the modes are going to be very, very fast. Okay, so th this was the general idea at the beginning based on the charge picture. Because again, it's very easy to understand why here in the middle you have a, from symmetry, if these are charges, why the only eigenvalue here is in the middle, right? Okay, so the idea is the following. Uh, we can construct energy states, for example, for the funnel model. Um, we can construct energy states and energy levels that satisfy these two conditions. And this is, this is for example, uh, one of the states. So you see the overlap is exactly what I asked. And I can do the same uh, for what we call the, the crawl model. This will be based on some uh, further demand for uh, symmetry. And that is, I want not, so, so in the final model, I'm searching here, and this is a very special point. But in this uh, crawl model, I add one more constraint, and that is all the sites are equivalent from the point of view of search. So I have also rotational symmetry. So the transition from here to here is going to be also the same from here to here, or from here, let's say from here to here is the same from here to here. Uh, this is a, a, a achieved by choosing the eigenvalues as nodes, like Fourier nodes, and, and then creating the Hamiltonian which is described here, these are all connected to all Hamiltonians. So we do this and I just give you the result, what is Fn? So this Fn is for the funnel model. So what I have here is a system of size uh, 50 and I have Fn and I start at different initial conditions. And then what you see is that Fn is roughly 0 0.02. There are some fluctuations. But the remarkable thing is that Fn is equal to zero identically for any n bigger than the size of the system. So this means that you detect the particle with probability one before some certain time. You are guaranteed, no matter what is your initial condition, you detect the particle after some time. And this is a, a guaranteed search. It's secure that you will find the particle and you will not need to measure very much within a finite time. There is a special initial condition, which is this delta function. You see here, if I start at state zero and measure there, which is the return problem, the probability is one. So this is much uh, not to scale. So this is 0 0.02, this, uh, this Fn's, and this is one. So this is a very remarkable thing and this is related to what I showed you already previously. If you start and measure at the same point, you get some remarkable feature. You detect with one measurement actually uh, this, 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 uh, this state. Now for the crawl model, this was this uh, basis where you have this uh, symmetry of all the states are equivalent on, on the graph. Uh, then we get deterministic search. Uh, we find that for any localized initial condition, Fn is one at some given time. So this cannot be better than that. You have no fluctuations at all on this type of search. And this is because, again, all the eigenvalues of the survival operator are put to zero. So now we say, and this is uh, towards the end of my talk, I said, okay, um, if this is true, let us now forget at all about the measurements and let us just look at the unitary evolution and understand what's going on here. So this is this crawl model. Um, and what you see here is just the solution of the Schrodinger equation. So this is for a system of size 20 uh, and the, 
this is the wave function as a function of time. And in this crawl model, in this basis, what happens is the following. The wave packet is localized at given times on the nodes of the graph. It's walking like a unidirectional motion on this graph. So you are at zero after time tau, you are at point 0.1 after time two time, you are at point, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you are walking uh, like this. Now, the funnel model is different. The funnel model, uh, you spread out all over the system. This is again, the wave function with no measurements, but you have this revival after 20 steps in this case. It doesn't matter how big the systems are, you'll have this revival. This is why in the previous transparency I showed you, you detect here with probability one. Now, this is very remarkable because what does this mean? It means that I can transfer from one node of the graph to another node of the graph and to any other node of the graph, this motion. Now, this is also related to what we call a massless Dirac uh, particle, and this will be the end of the talk. So, we started the, the discussion on this part by just demanding that the eigenvalues uh, are all zero. And then we have a huge exceptional points. The size of the exceptional point, the, the degree of the exceptional point is the size of the Hilbert space because all of the eigenvalues are at zero. But why is this related to Dirac? Well, uh, this will be my end. And um, so let us understand this. Um, so in Dirac uh, physics, we have this very famous uh, relation between the energy levels and the mass of the particle. So we, first of all, we say this is a massless Dirac particle, so the mass is zero. And then the energy goes like K. Um, this is exactly the same like what we demanded before that uh, the energy spectrum will go like K such that the energy differences will be the same. Uh, that is the way we constructed this from the beginning. Uh, furthermore, what is the uh, uh, property of a Dirac uh, uh, particle is that because of the, this linear relation between K that also we have, is that if you start with the wafer packet, now on continuum, because this omega K is proportional to K, you have no widening of the wave packet. It grows like a delta function. This is because of the dispersion, omega k goes like k. And why is a Dirac massless Dirac particle so good for search? It's obvious because it doesn't spread. The wave pack, it doesn't spread. And if it doesn't spread, then great. Then when you measure, you detect the particle with probability one. No dispersion is good for you if you want to find the particle and transfer it to one point to the other. Of course, all the physics that we are doing here is based on Schrodinger physics, but we engineered it in such a way that it is creating effectively a massless Dirac particle. Now, just a final remark, you can ask, okay, where is the electron and where is the antiparticle? Where's the particle and antiparticle? So you see here that this motion is breaking the time reversal symmetry. If I take the complex conjugate of my Hamiltonian, the, the motion will be in the other direction. So I can zig and zag if I want, if I change the Hamiltonian from one value to its complex conjugate. Of course, the Hamiltonian is still Hermitian, but it breaks time reversal symmetry. On the other hand, the final model, there's no time reversal symmetry. Okay, so I think I, I'm done. Uh, I just uh, showed you on the tip of the iceberg a, a few uh, analogies between the quantum walk and the classical walk. And towards the end, we discussed these exceptional points. And um, okay, if there are some questions I can answer. Yeah, thank you, Ali. Um, You're welcome. Uh, yeah, now are there questions? Yeah, Carlos, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, I, I have many questions, but I, I'll just do one. Uh, when you show the, the behavior of the variance of the detection time as a function of uh, tau, there was this, this minimal, this uh, dash red line shows a minimal variance value 
for a certain given town, which is something not related to any symmetry. What's, what's the meaning of that? Uh, what happens there? Why the variance is minimal there? Okay, so what happens for this particular Hamiltonian um, in this charge picture, you, you can get, uh, you know, these eigenvalues, they, they can come close to this, uh, the middle, and then the relaxation and the variance will be much smaller than typical. But they cannot not in this Hamiltonian go to zero exactly. So to look at this minima, you need to know all the eigenvalues in the system, which is hard. Um, uh, and this will create this uh, eigenvalue. Why is there a specific tau? Uh, th this, th in the charge picture, it's obvious that there, there will be some tau uh, th that will be minimum for the reason I said before, because again, if you have charge, if you have eigenvalues approaching the unit circle, the variance is very big. And if they go to the middle, they are very small. Um, so they in all these problems, uh, by, by the way, also for the average n, for the average n uh, versus tau, not for this return problem, you also have these minima. Uh, the, the, why, the reason why you must have a minima is simply if you start for tau equals zero, then obviously you must diverge. This is because mm -hmm. of Zeno physics. Yeah. And then as I, sh I showed, you have these divergences here uh, where is the money minima? Is it here or there? That's not trivial. So that's no geometric. Uh, no, th this is uh, dirty. This is related to the whole spectrum. You need to analyze the full. As far as I know, there is no simple way to find this. Uh, maybe okay. I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. I have uh, Felipe first and then Abishe. You can. Ask your question, Felipe. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hi. Yes, I, I was wondering uh, when the graph, or one vertex of the graph has more than two links, how, how do you do that? I mean, there are many options. And since you talk about symmetry, I was wondering how, how, how do you do it? You, you mean in the context of this? Uh, mod, mod or for instance, when, when you have this one third, one third, one third. Yes. You are the beginning, okay. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, yes, I'm listening. Yeah, like like there for instance. So yes, yes. how do you, so I, I so you have, um, yeah, so yeah, in fact, my, my question is the, the wave function is only defined on the vertices, not on the links. Yes, so again, I start, this is what I defined at the beginning. I start on one of the vertices and I measure on another one. Um, you, you can start with all kinds of initial conditions. Um, we talk about this a lot in our paper, but here I, I just want to start here and I measure here, or I want to start here and I measure here. And next to each starting point, I, I, I tell you what is the probability of your detection. So de depending on starting points, you have different probabilities, which are obviously related to symmetry. So this three here is the number of nearest neighbors here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so, but my question is, there is only hoping between sites. That, that, so the, the distance between uh, vertices is, is, is not important. Well, it, 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 these the, specific Hamiltonians, they describe adjacency matrix. So you have some amplitude uh, uh, jumping between sites. But for example, here you see, we, 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 I didn't talk about this, but we, we can have any Hamiltonian that you want. So for example, here, the, the, this uh, link is uh, stronger than the other links. So in general, um, um, okay, this, uh, this discussion was, for specifically for adjacency matrices, but we, we can go beyond that and consider all kinds of Hamiltonians if you want, and th then the, the links will have different colors, uh, different strengths, which are just hopping amplitudes, HIJ between uh, two, two points. Uh, in general, if you, need, if you want to have some complicated Hamiltonian where the symmetry is not obvious, then you'll need to use this formula here to calculate P detection but it's not so intuitive. So I, I, I presented a simple case where 
uh, all, this, uh, all the jumps are the same, uh, just to simplify this general formula. Okay, thank you. Okay. Avishek. Uh, yeah. uh, hi, Ali. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I had two questions. Uh, so the uh, one is, I mean, I didn't quite uh, completely understand the crawl model, and so how, uh, I mean, how exactly do you manage to get this Dirac spectrum for this uh, model? I mean, so, so yes, the, the, I, I'm sorry, I was a bit fast, but thank you for asking again. But um, so the, the idea is again, I, I want to create a Hamiltonian. Uh, that such that uh, all these eigenvalues of the survival operator are here in the middle. And the demand is that all these uh, overlaps, th these are, you take the EK times the XM, the measurement divide place, it squared is, so this is this PK, they are all the same. So we have these charges and the energies are, energy times tau, these are locations are, equally distance. So I have two demands on energy and these overlaps. These two demands uh, create many types of Hamiltonians such that the exceptional point here is the size of the, uh, the size of the Hilbert space. So this is gigantic uh, degeneracy and gigantic exceptional point. But then, okay, so I need to uh, uh, do that and then, uh, I do that um, in the crawl model, I use as a basis uh, the Fourier modes, the Fourier modes on the graph. So I, I just take them by hand. I, I say, this is my uh, modes. And once I create the modes, I can create the Hamiltonian because I also know something on the energy difference. So this is reverse engineering. I know the states. I know the energy levels, and then I know the Hamiltonian. Now you can ask a question, maybe that's a question, how will you create such an Hamiltonian in the real world? And the answer Thank is, you. the answer is that uh, this I was talking with many people that in, uh, in this quantum computing business uh, with ions, with waveguides, you can create a rather general Hamiltonians. This is a very big issue in uh, quantum uh, uh, technology these days, uh, for example, Roy Ozeri from Weizmann, he does it with ions, uh, uh, they can create these Hamiltonians. So I'm now acting like an engineer. I'm asking what is the best Hamiltonian, not what is the Hamiltonian. I'm not doing what I usually do is take an Hamiltonian and solve it. Okay, so, uh, so finally it's going to be the actual Hamiltonian is probably going to we have some long range hoppings and so on, right? Right, so you, you, th this is this graph. Oh, this is you the graph, long okay. range. This is, the, this is what I plotted here and... Um, and okay, okay, okay. So this, uh, these are all the couplings and they can be, they have different strengths and so on. Yes, yes, yes. Right, it's okay. very complicated. And uh, I, I asked some people, is it possible? They said, maybe it's possible for a, a, a ring with six, six, six or five sides. So I will not say that this is the new type of quantum computing, but uh, this is more like a game for small systems at this stage. But uh, certainly people can engineer such Hamiltonians and they do it. Uh, it's really a big topic now in, uh, in this business. Okay. Because uh, this, this is exactly what they want to do. They want to control, the, they want to move the wave function from place to place and control it, et cetera. Um, but it's, of course, different than what we usually do. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Alberto, is there time for another question? Uh, well, I guess we, we have just five minutes break, so. I